Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Global Issue Speaker Series presented by ACC International Programs. My name is William Hayden. I'm the Director of International Programs at Austin Community College. So I'm glad to see the turnout we have this evening for our presentation, Live Aid or Women's Empowerment, How Should We Respond to Global Hunger, presented by Linda Cox, Adjunct Professor of Philosophy at ACC. Um, if some of you haven't signed up on the sheet in the back table uh, for extra credit, please do before you leave. Um, otherwise, we're ready to go. Turn on my microphone there. Everybody can hear me okay. Well, I teach philosophy and ethics here at ACC, and some of you may actually be my online students. Anybody here? One of my online, great. I would love to say hi to you after just to put a name with a face. Um, I've been teaching here for nine years now. But I want to first of all thank William Hayden from the International Studies Program for allowing me to come tonight and talk to you. And I also want to thank the RUT uh, Hemispheres Program who works with ACC professors bringing in different topics to uh, help us globalize our curriculum. And this work comes from one of those sessions, uh, working especially with sociologist Raj Patel, who's over at UT. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I know this is the dinner hour, so um, since this is a global hunger talk, I guess we're having sort of a multi-sensory experience, if, if you think of it that way. But I do appreciate your coming out now and traffic and all of that. So, um, global hunger is a, a growing crisis, as we all know. Um, my experience with thinking about global hunger really started when I was a child in the 70s and 80s, um, seeing a, a sitcom actress uh, come on TV and tell us about how terrible the droughts were in Ethiopia, how people, people were dying, children were starved, they were emaciated, there were flies. You know, I'm not showing you those pictures, but these are unfortunately pictures of animals. This is actually this drought in the 80s in Ethiopia. So many of us in our comfortable Western houses felt compassion and felt moved to do something, moved at least to start thinking about what's going on in the rest of the world. It was kind of a wake-up call. So I do, I want to start with that idea that we, we have a, a part of ourselves that is drawn to the compassion of that you know that comes from these images that we see. So I don't want to dis I don't want to discount that as I go through here. But did anybody see this film, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody? Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. So it ends with this big scene of Live Aid. Live Aid was a concert in 1985. Um, it was organized by rock artist Bob Geldof who was uh, creating this concert with a live audience of two billion people around the world at the same time. Um, and there's actually a sequel to Bohemian Rhapsody that's supposed to focus just on Live Aid, the concert. And recently, Queen guitarist uh, Brian May said that he would like to see now, he just said this a couple days ago, another Live Aid concert for climate change. So I'm thinking maybe we'll consider that question. Is that a good idea by the end of this and see what we think about that idea? So what was the 1985 Live Aid concert raising money for? So in Ethiopia, famine in this time was the worst in a century and perhaps the worst in recorded history. Uh, there was record low rainfall, but this wasn't the only cause of the enormous famine that killed 500,000 to 1 million people, depending on who you asked at that time, affecting children first. Um, it turns out there were very complex reasons for this. And I'm not an African scholar, but I do think it's important to understand some of the context for this concert. Ethiopia ha was one of the richest and um, proudest African nations. And according to scholar Louise Davis, 
uh, what happened was a longtime beloved leader became unpopular during the 1970s oil crisis, and so a Soviet regime took control. And this regime committed violence against the ethnic minorities, created policies that restricted the actions of the peasant farmers and reduced their numbers very you know, drastically. Um, so when the famines did hit, what happened was they promoted a media campaign, it was a disinformation campaign, to argue that it was the drought and overpopulation that was causing the, this famine, this great hunger event. So at the same time, the U.S. was denying, either ignoring it or even denying aid because it was a Soviet regime. So there's a lot of complicated factors that went into this. But, you know, most of us just saw on TV Sally Struthers, this actress, talking about the, the poor children, and we have this vision of um, what Africa must be like. So it was unfortunate that that was coming from all of these different angles, this disinformation. So what happened next was that in 1984, a BBC reporter named Michael Burke was visiting Africa, and he noticed firsthand the scale of this famine. Um, and he was the one who created the graphic TV reports that came back. Um, and he spurred then, he inspired Bob Geldof to create a charity called Band-Aid. Um, and you may have heard the song, Do They Know It's Christmas Time? Anybody old enough to know that song? Um, yeah, well, of course, the irony was that most Ethiopians were Christians, so they're probably going to know when it's Christmas time. Um, but this was a kind of stereotyping that was going on in the time, again, for that good cause. And the, the droughts were there, the famines really were there. So it's a complicated issue. Um, but then in 1985, the next year, Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie uh, wrote, We Are the World, and Bono joined in, and then there was this big Live Aid concert at Wembley in Philadelphia. Um, so it was 16 hours long, broadcast live, satellites were linked. It was, it was a huge event. It helped to pro propel many careers of these artists. It also helped the cities where they were held, helped the corporate sponsors, and oh yeah, it also helped the African uh, shelters be built and helped um, hospitals be built. So it, it seems like a win-win situation for everybody. So Geldof was still going strong. He had spin-offs for 25 years after this. And there's no question that these concerts raised awareness and brought, did a lot of good in terms of social services and, and aid to the folks there. Um, but it wasn't so simple as Geldof himself notes. So let's take a look at this. You can be absolutely sure on the day you die, somebody is alive in Africa because one day you bought a record or a book or watched a pop concert. And that at once is a compliment and a triumph. And on the other hand, it's the ultimate indictment of us all. So I would just ask, what do you think he means by that? Anybody have a... Does that have a response to that? Do you agree or do you know what he might mean? This is going to be somewhat interactive. So feel free to, to comment. Yes? Could it mean that the, uh, you say on one hand you helped somebody, but on the other hand it took, you know, it took having to go and buy something like a luxury for you to help save a life? Okay, so the motivation was really to help yourself in some way, but you're helping the other person at the same time. Um, yeah, any... Uh-huh. Uh, it could also be that you're doing so little and still getting that satisfaction. Like, oh, yes, I've helped someone. I don't have to do any more, but you're doing functionally very little to do, if anything. Yeah, you don't have to sacrifice much or, you know, go much out of your way in order to do this thing that... Now you feel good about the problem being solved. Yeah, I think those are, are both 
good responses to what he's talking about here and this, um, this idea that we can have a, a live aid concert and then we've solved the problem in some way, at least in our moral sense. So some might say, so I do want to acknowledge that um, the, the problems that I spoke of earlier with uh, providing aid and in that sense that of how we all at the time had a, a one-dimensional picture of what Africa was like. Um, that's really unfortunate and it's the type of stereotyping and loss of dignity that a Nigerian writer, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, writes about in terms of being the danger of a single story. When I only see a single story of someone, I have this tendency to stereotype them. Even though it might be partly true, it's limited. It's only one dimensional. So we can think of the sense of dignity then in her ideas that we're, um, we're all multidimensional people. There's a lot of um, facets to us. And so we have a tendency to perpetuate these stereotypes when we buy into that um, disinformation. So let's keep that in mind. But some people might say then, OK, uh, we don't want to have people lose their dignity, so let's just not provide any aid at all. Let's let them fend for themselves and pull themselves up, and that's, a, that's the way we should um, allow people to have dignity to be restored. So what I'm going to argue tonight is that we can help global hunger without reducing the dignity and sovereignty of persons and groups. So we can help. It's not a hands-off problem. There's a way that we can help without reducing dignity. And not only that, but it, that we should do that, that it's the right thing to do. So there are four questions I'm going to be looking at. The first will be, what is hunger and what is global hunger? It'll turn out this is the biggest question of all, how we define what hunger is. Um, is global hunger still a problem? How big of a problem is it today? I don't feel it very much. I had a nice lunch. You know, how big a problem is this? Uh, do we have a moral obligation to help end hunger? And this is a real question that a lot of people ask. Why should I help? So I'm going to go over some uh, responses to that. And then, if we do have a moral obligation to help, what's the most ethical way to do so? So I'm going to be starting by looking at three definitions of hunger. Um, and global hunger we'll just be considering as an aggregate, you know, a big grouping of all the individual and localized types of uh, instances of hunger. But it's on a global scale. Uh, so I'm going to be showing how the way we define hunger is crucial for how we actually address the problem. So for now, we're going to talk about a standard definition of hunger as undernourishment. So the definition according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, or the FAO, of the United Nations is that undernourished individuals are those whose dietary energy consumption is continuously below minimum dietary energy requirement for maintaining a normal, active, healthy lifestyle. So this has to do with your energy requirement, your calories. Um, now it's measured in terms of things like are children stunted or wasting? Stunted is when you are uh, you don't have enough height for your age for children under five. Wasting is when your weight is too low for children. Um, it's measured by the breastfeeding rate, um, whether women get enough iron, well, you know what the anemia rate is, um, and things like overweight and obese children and adults. This is a new, relatively new measurement, and as, as well as malnourishment in terms of other micronutrients. Uh, so, after World War II, Food for Peace was the organization that was founded um, in the 50s and into the 60s by John F. Kennedy. He created the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, by executive order in 1961 to lead the U.S. government's international development and human humanitarian efforts. 
And it also, they're very clear, even today, to point out that the American food relief programs were designed in part to reduce the threat of communism. So this was part of the political and economic project that was going on then. And the, there were benefits. There were certainly benefits. Um, people were fed. U.S. farmers were prioritized in raising the food. Um, the threat of communism was apparently reduced. So again, it seems like this win-win situation. Uh, but there were some problems with simply sending food as aid, which we'll, we're going to be looking at later. But if we go ahead and look at today, look at the state of global undernourishment now. This is a chart, again, from UNICEF, or the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, all got together and measured these sorts of things now. So we can see that there are some ways that undernourishment has improved in the last years. We can see a trend toward low birth rates is going down. So that's good. We don't want to have low birth rates. Let's see if I can point over here. Yeah, and then exclusive breastfeeding, which has many nutritional health and uh, immune, what's the word? Immuno protection later in life. Lots of good things come from breastfeeding. And that's on the rise. These gray areas are the projected increases in the next few years. We can see that stunting is down for children under five. Wasting is actually, in some areas, rising a little bit. Um, and then there are some other areas that are clearly rising. Children under five who are overweight is on the rise. Anemic women on the rise. And obesity in adults is rising. And we've just had a report a few weeks ago that shows that the number of obese adults globally now exceeds the number of underweight adults. So it really makes us realize that when we have this idea of the emaciated, starving person as the hungry person, we really have to shift the way we think about hunger, even in terms of undernourishment today. Because that's certainly a very different picture than the 70s and 80s picture of what a hungry person should look like. Um, so the interesting thing here is that the daily per capita caloric supply, in other words, how many calories per person do we get these days, is rising. We have more calories per person globally than we did in the 1960s. It's going up. Uh, in fact, it's grown, it's increased 30% since 1961. So calories are going up. But the problem is that while undernourishment was dropping, we're now starting to see a rise again. This is what is sounding the alarms today. Um, here's a close-up of just in the last 10 years. You can see how it was dropping and dropping, but then starting around 2015, it's coming back again, and it's at the same rate that it was. Um, it's projected to be the same rate as 10 years ago. So we can see why viewing hunger simply as undernourishment, especially if we're looking at it just as a lack of calories, pure calories, um, can lead to very insufficient solutions, like simply sending more food. That's not going to resolve many of the problems, even if, by the way, we define hunger as undernourishment. So in 1996, the Food and Agriculture, the FAO again, of the UN, came up with a better definition of what hunger is. So this is definition number two then, hunger as food insecurity. You probably hear this a lot. This is still the working definition, if you will, for what hunger is. So this concept tries to capture the uh, notion of hunger not as a deficit of calories, but as a violation of a broader set of social, economic, and physical conditions, according to Patel. In 1996, the FA, uh, FAO published this definition, food security at the individual household, national, regional, and global level is achieved when all people 
at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their daily food, uh, needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So I put in bold the four words there that are the key to understanding how food security is defined now. It's, um, we have access to it. So not only is the food grown and available, but actually people have to access it in order for it to work. So this is a much more substantive definition. People have to be, um, have to access it, it has to be available, and it has to be utilized by the body. In other words, it has to be nutritional food, food that actually meets your needs. And then finally, it, it needs to be safe, or it, we need to have stability. So that means that if you're trying to eat and you're in a war zone, you're probably not food secure. Uh, we're going to look at the impact of climate change on food security. And bad policies, if you have a, a corrupt government that doesn't um, create policies that are safe and secure, then you won't have food security. So those are the four dimensions that people talk about in terms of how to define food security. And there are two ways in the past, especially, that have been, uh, and in the present, that we've tried to solve global hunger. Instead of sending actual food, like we did when we were thinking it was just a deficit of calories, now there are two other ways that we think about it, maybe monetization, and the other is the corporate and government partnerships. So monetization is when you provide money or loans to buy food, seed, fertilizer. So you're not giving the food directly, you're giving them money so that the, the specific location that's having hunger can buy their own food from local people and local farmers. So that's the idea. So the claim there is that you'll allow local farmers the chance to grow and produce food, uh, supporting the local economy. This is why the World Bank promotes monetization. Um, and it claims to support the dignity of the farmers, producing for themselves. They're just having a loan for this. But there are some problems with this that we're going to see. Um, first of all, these loans come with strings attached. So what that means is that the farmers have to follow the terms of the loan, often purchasing only seed and fertilizer from Western sources or from prescribed sources that, the, that are specified in the loan. So that can be a complication here um, and a problem. And there's also the argument that local methods um, are driven out of business this way. If you're only allowed to buy certain seeds or certain fertilizer, then the more localized or traditional ways that you may have adjusted to um, the new whatever's causing the hunger in your area are going to be left behind because there's a, a prescribed way to address that problem. So in addition to that, only 10% of rural women in places like Sub-Saharan Africa have access to these loans. So 10%, 90% then are given to the men in the, these regions. So that's one way, monetization. Another way is these partnerships between corporations and governments and non-governmental organizations. So the idea here is that you develop better food technologies um, like genetic, genetically modified seeds, herbicides, fertilizer. You de develop the, the techniques for transportation and production. And you can get the food where it's needed. So that can solve the problems of access and uh, availability, utilization, and safety. So that's the goal, is to provide a secure um, food security in those four pillars with these partnerships. But here's the problem with that. According to the World Food Prog Program, in 2017, almost 124 million people across 51 countries and territories still faced crisis levels of acute food insecurity or worse, requiring emergency action to safeguard their lives, preserve their livelihoods. So if you look at this, this is compared to 2015, 
right here. This was 80 million people were in this acute state of food insecurity. And in 2016, it jumps up to 108,000. And by 2017, it's at 120 some odd thousand. So 124 million, sorry, 124 million people. Um, so that's more than a 50% increase in two years. So this is another one of those big alarms that's sounding in the global community. And this should alarm everybody. The numbers are, are jumping up. I can't even keep up with the numbers to present them to you because new numbers come out every day. Today there were more numbers out from the, from the IPCC. Um, so undernourishment, again, remember, was trending up. But acute food insecurity is actually leaping up. And this is despite all of the food technologies, despite the 30% increase in food production globally, the numbers are just going up and up. So we're still trying to figure out what's, what's going on. Why can't we solve this problem? So I want to take a few minutes uh, to look at who's most affected by food insecurity and what the causes are. But I know this has been a lot of statistics, so we're going to try doing a little Kahoot questionnaire to see what we know about global food rising. So here's what you do. You get to get your phone out at this point and go to kahoot.it. Okay, I'm going to have to turn this down. I don't think we need the video. So it's kahoot.it. Don't forget the dot or you'll be like a, a close family member who will remain unnamed, who went, did it without the dot, and got invited to download a, a security system and did so. And we're like, no, no, that's probably malware, but you don't need to do anything. All that will happen is a screen will pop up. Looks like some of you have already done this. You just enter your name. That's all you have to give. Don't give any other security information for this. You don't have to register for it or anything. Um, and here's the code that you enter to add your name to this group. So we're going to see who, uh, it will give us a little contest and we'll see who wins at the end. I thought about bringing candy as a prize, but then I realized this is a talk on hunger and nourishment, so probably that's not a good idea. So that's why you just get a good pat on the back as your prize today. Can you repeat the website, please? Kahoot.it. It's right here. K-A-H-O-O-T dot it. Don't forget the dot. I always say that. Um, yeah, so just a few, a few more minutes. Looks like we have a, a good number of players. Everybody pretty much in. If you aren't, maybe it's, it's actually not critical. You could still answer the questions without being in here. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start us on this quiz. So we're gonna answer five questions to start with, and then we'll put the stats behind them. Yes, we are ready. Okay. So what percentage of the world population is hungry? You have 15 seconds to answer this. Uh, so, 14, got it right. Most people answered 20%, or 20, sorry, answered 17%. The correct answer is 11% of the world population is hungry. All right. We're going to take a look at these a little bit more in a minute. Let's go to the next question. All right, Sloan. How many people are hungry in Eastern Africa? And it should say what percentage of people in Eastern Africa are hungry. So it was 11% worldwide. What about Eastern Africa? All right. I 
again, it's a little higher than you think. It's 31% of the population of the populations in Eastern Africa are hungry. All right. What percentage of U.S. population is hungry? You guys figured out this Kahoot it much faster than the group of adults I did it with. All right, the, the numbers are pretty getting smaller here. So yeah, two and a half percent. And we know what hunger looks like, or many of us have you know, worked with people that are hungry or understand that, but now we have to put this to scale. Our problem is two and a half percent versus 31 percent in Eastern Africa. All right. And what percentage of hungry people in the world are women and girls? Yeah, lots of you got this one, 60%. Okay, was that five questions? Four questions. I think I have one more question for now. Okay. Okay, here we go. In developing countries, what percentage of landholders are women? There's music happening, but I'm going to keep it down. Maybe we need a little bit of it to inspire. Okay, so yeah, you were listening. This is actually, I was talking about access to credit a minute ago when I said 10%, but it's also true that 10 to 20% of landholders in developing countries are women. So we're going to take a little break from this right now and go back to this part. Um, so where is hunger most prevalent? It's most prevalent in Eastern, for example, in Eastern Africa, although there are more hungry people or undernourished people in Asia, but the prevalence, the rate, is greater in uh, Eastern Africa. And again, 821 million people worldwide are now considered hungry, which is 11% of the world population. And women and girls are most affected. 60% are chronically hungry. Of chronically under, hungry people are women and girls. Um, countries with the highest levels of hunger also have very high levels of gender inequality. There is a correlation. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there are more than 120 women living in poor households for every 100 men. Um, and for de developing countries, we, this is the one we just talked about, 10 to 20% of landholders are women, and 10% of available credit is offered to women. So let's take a look now and see why hunger is on the rise. So let's go back now to our last few questions, three more questions here. Are you ready? Okay. True or false? Hunger is caused by poverty. It's actually true that hunger is caused by poverty. I think we had fewer people playing that time. Um, so it's, the, it's one of the principal causes of hunger. 767 million people live below the international poverty line. And does anybody know what that, what in dollars, in US dollars, what the poverty line is? Uh, 
according to the World Bank? Any guesses? That would have been a good question. Less than $1.90 a day. So although the number of people living in extreme poverty globally has been declining, some regions like, again, sub-Saharan Africa, the number is actually growing. So hunger is caused by poverty, but of course poverty also can be a cause, a, a leading cause of hunger. So if you can't, uh, if you have poor health, small body size, low levels of energy, reduction in your mental functioning, you're not going to be able to grow as much food and it can lead to greater poverty in various ways. So the two are interrelated. Um, so here's our, our second to the last question, I think. All right, doing well there. True or false? The world doesn't grow enough food to feed everyone. Correct, it's false. The world does already grow enough food to feed everyone. Let's take a look at this. Um, we grow enough food right now to be, feed 10 billion people, and the world only has about 7.5 billion people. So there's more than enough food grown. What's happening to all the food then? Any ideas? Yeah. A lot of it is thrown away. 30% of the food that is grown from, for human consumption is thrown away worldwide. Do you know what percentage of food we in the U.S. throw away? 40% of the food grown for people in the U.S. gets thrown away. Um, so we already produce enough food to feed everybody. So this is Raj Patel that I was talking to you about. One of the most enduring misconceptions about hunger is that it's primarily the result in a global deficit in food production. If this were so, we might expect food to be absent at times and places where people die of hunger, yet economist Amartya Sen has shown that in the majority of cases of widespread famine-related death since World War II, food has been available within the famine-affected area. People have died not for want of food, but for want of the entitlement to eat it. And let me go back to that question of what, where is all the food going? We're throwing some of it away. There's another place where all of that food goes. Yeah. Overconsumption? Overconsumption? Well, this is talking about even the food that we don't, like you, if, if you, Factor in overconsumption too. We still, um, there's still too much food for us. Where's all that food going? We're wasting the, the part of it that is for humans, we're wasting. What's that? It gets stored. It gets stored, um, it gets stored for what? To feed the cattle, to feed the livestock. 45% of the food grown in the world actually goes to livestock. 55% is for human consumption. And then of that 55%, the U.S. wastes 40% of it, even when we overconsume. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a big problem. So I have, I think, two more questions here. Let me... Try to do okay. All right, Jamie nine six three doing really well. What percentage of the eight hundred and twenty one million hungry people in the world live in regions of war or conflict? should have music going all the time. Okay, 50%. 
live in regions of war or conflict. And I'm actually not going to talk a lot about that, but I do have one slide on it. We'll take a quick look at. More than half live in, live in countries affected by conflict. And here's a, a sad number. 75% of the children in the world who are stunted live in conflict areas. So that's one of the main reasons why we see that number sort of questionable. And here are those primary areas. All right, last question. Wow. Which of the following statements is true? All right, everybody got it because both of those statements are right. Climate change does make food production worse. In what ways would that be? Yeah. Higher temperatures. Higher temperatures. Uh, crops we like to consume harder to grow. Okay, crops are harder to grow. Any other ideas? Yeah. Flooding. Flooding? Yeah. Or the opposite problem, drought? Mm hmm. Extreme weather events. Um, so we, we should be seeing higher food prices, lower crop productivity, lower nutritional value, and distributions in getting it where it needs to go. All four of those pillars of food security are affected by climate change. We are going to talk about this a little more. How is it that food production, though, could make climate change worse? Yes. Okay, you've got, you've got that industrial factory component of food that's cr producing the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, anything else? Yeah. Livestock. Livestock, right. Remember, 45% of that food is being raised for livestock. So that's going to mean methane production. It's going to mean transportation. And here's another interesting little fact and figure that the, if you put 100 calories in to feed the cow, you're only getting three or four calories out of it. Whereas the number for raising poultry is higher, and I don't know those numbers. Um, and of course, if you just go ahead and eat the grain and the, the beans that are grown, you get the full 100 calories for people. So what we eat has a huge impact on the climate and how that food is grown has a big impact on what we eat. So it's, it's related. These two are, are intimately related. All right, so let's see. Maria is the winner, 6,000 points. So that's just for fun there. Okay. Let's go back over here now. Okay. So I'm... I'm only going to say as a note that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is overwhelmingly the effect of carbon dioxide emissions and that these emissions are the result of human activity. So there's widespread agreement on that. I will say that we should be more specific and say that humans in industrialized countries are the primary producers of this carbon dioxide emissions. emissions. So I do want to look at two quick studies on climate uh, change and how it relates to food. So we can see this, um, the rise in extreme climate-related disasters here. You can see all of the different events like floods, storms, droughts on the bottom here. And then when you aggregate them all, you get that line at the top, the dotted line, the total events. So you can see what's happened since 1990 and how that variability is increasing. Um, so it's possible you're thinking, well, I'm not really affected that much by it, so maybe it's not as bad as everybody says it is. Well, what I just want to say is look at this next study, and that might give us a, a, you know, a, a, 
a reason why we have a tendency to think that. So this is a study that looks, this came out last year, and it shows a couple of interesting correlations. What it's doing is it's looking at the relative change in the standard deviation of monthly temperature anomalies. So basically how much, when you're looking at it vertically, this SD or standard deviation change is talking about the extreme weather events that we were just looking at, but in terms of temperature anomalies that are different than usual. So it's comparing that to, on the left side, gross domestic product per capita, so how wealthy is the country, and over here, it's looking at how much carbon dioxide emissions, emissions does that country produce. And all these little dots are different countries. I've circled the US in both cases. So you can see uh, the red line is stable, basically. There's no um, zero change in te temperature variability. And that's the same in both of these charts. The blue line on the left is the population halfway point. So half of the population of the world is over here. The other half is over here. And the blue line over here means half of the carbon dioxide emissions and half the other half is over here. So what we can see from this, and I put the, the, the unhappy face here because we really, in most cases, not always, but in most cases, temperature anomalies are not helpful. They're not a benefit. So we don't like those. So you have extreme weather the higher you go up here, and you have how wealthy you are and how wealthy you are over here. So what you can see is that here in the U.S., which is high on the wealthy axis, we don't see a lot of extreme weather events. Um, Sweden doesn't. Finland, Norway, these countries don't see a lot of extreme variability in the weather temperatures. Um, now, who produces the most? Well, again, the U.S. is almost at the top of this list. Canada, Finland, Australia, the ones that come this way. Again, we're down in this quadrant, so we're not feeling the effects of the emissions that we're producing. So I think that's why it's possible that we are just going about thinking that it's not that bad, because we don't tend to see the effects of it. Um, and, and that's what this chart is really trying to show. The authors of this said that the countries that have contributed least to climate change and are most vulnerable to extreme events are projected to experience the strongest increase in variability. These changes would therefore amplify the inequality associated with the impacts of climate change. So, uh, it's kind of like, well, I have this picture, because it's kind of like if I live in a wealthy neighborhood and I take all my trash and I keep going down and dumping it all in a poorer neighborhood, I'm never going to see the effects of it piling up because it's all... Um, Everything's happy for me. But that's this idea that our, our actions, we may, we may be, it may seem to us that it's not there, but we really need to look more closely at what's happening and think about it from a global perspective. And in fact, if we think about it that way, I think that we can see that we may even have an obligation, a moral obligation to think about what's happening down the road. We know this is there, we know these studies are there, so um, we have an obligation to look at it and to understand what, what role we play in it. So kind of going back now, we're still on that definition of hunger as food sovereignty. We just took a little detour to look at who's the most, I'm sorry, as food insecurity. We're talking about um, who's the most affected by food insecurity, what are some of the causes of food insecurity. Um, and now and we, we also looked at what are some of the potential solutions from a food insecurity perspective. Maybe we want to monetize and provide money for the local communities. Um, but the problem with that was that there were strings attached and it, we don't always give loans to the women. Um, and then 
Maybe we want to increase food technologies. All of those different ways that governments and corporations and non-governmental organizations get together and work out deals um, supposedly to increase the food security of a country. And now we're going to kind of look at what are some of the problems with depending on these food technologies. So as the president of Malawi said, fertilizer is only useful if there's the right amount of rain. If we're in a climate change extreme weather event and it's a drought, fertilizer is not going to help us. The technologies also ben often benefit the multinational national corporation more than the local farmers. Um, there are controversies surrounding genetically modified foods, as we know. Monoculture destroys biodiversity. And monoculture is when you're just growing one crop, all soybeans or all corn. Um, we're, you're losing the diversity of the different types of plants in, even within a single kind of species. I'm not a biologist or an agricultural uh, scientist, but we know what monoculture and diversity of species, how important that is. And then the local agricultural knowledge, especially the knowledge of women, is devalued. We're going to look at some examples in a minute. And then women can't even access those loans and technologies. Yeah? Uh, about the GM foods, it, is, am, is, am I putting this wrong that the most controversy surrounding it is due more to lack of education? Because there is evidence that not only GM food, GM genetic modified foods help people who are having issues with food security but also do, in some instances, help with climate change, especially with the uh, increased amounts of uh, carbon dioxide taken from the air. You know, none of the things that I'm talking about, even on this list, are, I don't, I don't think the issue is, very, is simple. I would never say that genetically modified foods is bad. What I'm trying to do is argue that there's a, there are some problems with looking at food technology as the, as the solution. It's sometimes a solution. You know, there's a lot of research and arguments made by people like Vandana, Vandana Shiva, who make, uh, and Chinese women's name is escaping me, um, make the case against genetically modified foods. I'm not really familiar with those arguments because I think it is part of a systems approach. Um, but if, you know, maybe a little bit later, if somebody does know more, we can bring that into the conversation. Um, so these are just some of the problems that are commonly brought up about focusing food security on food technologies as if that's going to be the big solution. Because remember the problems with this. Um, we're focusing on these partners, but um, we still are seeing, even with all of these partnerships and genetically modified foods and um, slashing and burning and building more crops, remember we're, we're seeing more food produced per capita, but undernourishment is rising again and food insecurity is leaping again. That 50% rise in food insecurity. So despite our technologies, we're still seeing a problem and that's where we're talking about these alarms that are going off. So there's enough food to nourish. So what Vandana Shiva argues is that there's currently enough food to nourish everyone. It's kind of a logical argument. So if only it were distributed equally, hence there's not a strong argument for even having these food technologies to begin with. So that is uh, Mei Wan Ho is the other uh, person, the researcher I was talking about. So that's just something to consider, maybe research further, or maybe we, if some of you know more about it later, we can talk about that. So hunger, again, as food insecurity had its limitation then because it's being clear that the micro level of decision making that indigenous people, especially women, possess are often the, the very methods that show the most resiliency and adaptation to these climate events instead of a one-size-fits-all monoculture or a food technology. So the definition of hunger that I'm about to propose goes beyond food security to account for uh, food sovereignty. It adds a focus on the, the not just the access and availability of the food, but the production end of it as well. 
Because if we depend on technologies and corporations and governments to provide the food, then we're only looking at one end of it instead of in the production end. So food, so food, food sovereignty defines hunger as something that occurs when communities can't define their own food and agriculture policies in ways that are equitable, especially to women. So what does that mean? So Via Campesina is a peasant movement that has been making waves by trying to redefine hunger in terms of food sovereignty. Just like the definition of security, it's evolving, many faceted, but its core is that communities have the right to define their own food and agricultural policy. It doesn't mean that they're self-sufficient, they don't just provide everything that they have, but they do have control over the food systems, the power to decide what that system looks like. So that's what food sovereignty is about. Now we have to be careful, even here, when we're talking about food sovereignty, um, to consider that some traditional cultures are not gender equitable. And not only that, but the, in the places, again, remember, where there is gender inequality, there's also more hunger and more poverty. So those two are correlated. I'm not going to make a, a clear causal relationship now, but there's a, a utilitarian argument, if you will, for making sure that we have gender inequality, not just, uh, not just in terms of being the right or just thing to do, but also it's what works. When a crisis hits, women are the first to sacrifice the food worldwide. Um, 85 to 90 percent of the time spent on household food preparation is women's time around the world. And in some countries, tradition dictates that women eat last uh, after all of the other people have been fed. So when we're talking about food sovereignty, we do want to always combine that with gender equality. So here's just some more data on that. We've talked about those two, but women's local agricultural knowledge is often overtaken by those technologies and industrial agriculture. Also, the agriculture industry pays women 25% less. So there's systematically less access to those technologies, even if they were the answer for women to have. So that's the main relationship there. Does it work? We know that it's not just to do these things, but does it work? So yes, if you were to give access to productive resources, you know, food productive resources as men, they could increase yields on their farms 20 to 30 percent, which would lift 100 to 150 million out of hunger. Again, that's from the FAO. And also, to reduce child malnutrition, women's education was more effective than food availability improved 43% versus 26%. So these are just a sampling of some of the studies that show that gender equality has a, a buoying effect on the hunger problem. So the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that just came out not long ago at all, says that empowered and valued women in their societies increases their capacity to improve food security under climate change, make substantial contributions to their own well-being, to that of their families, and to their communities. It's one of the main ways that we can help um, solve this problem when we look at it from a sovereign perspective, food sovereignty. So we've talked about how there is a problem. Let's take a minute and kind of go a different direction now. We've seen that there's a problem, but we're over here. Do we have a moral obligation to help people? Um, some people might say that's their problem. I want to show you a few, three um, moral arguments, ethical arguments, for why we may have this obligation to help. And you can evaluate them for yourself. First, there are a couple myths about global hunger that I want to talk about. Both of these are by Garrett Hardin, who is a 20th century economist and philosopher. He's especially known for his essay on the tragedy of the commons. So this is a, an image that he gives. So you imagine 
that there is a sheep field that every that a hundred people share, um, and each person has one sheep. This is just a simplified version of this. Again, he's an economist, but trying to put this in a, a kind of a simple way. Each each person has one sheep worth one dollar. So when it stays at that level, we have stability. Everything's happy. Everybody's getting the maximum value of of mutton or whatever. Um, they get the, the maximum sale for their sheep. Everything's good. But then you have this guy, Fred, who gets a sneaky idea one day. He says, huh, we're all sharing this. Maybe I'll just put two sheep out there. Who's going to know? So I'll have two sheep. Everybody else has one sheep, and I'll get more money. Well, of course, that one sheep is destabilized the grass and you know there's now a little bit less nutrition in the grass so everybody is going to get let's say 90 cents a sheep now that's what it's worth so he gets though he's got his two sheep so it's a dollar 80 for him everybody else gets their 90 cents and nobody's nobody knows and but eventually when this happens more and more we start to see that there's a big problem um, so what he thinks is that, what Garrett Hardin thinks is that people are naturally greedy and that the commons, this idea of sharing this resource of the grass, is actually a tragedy. So it's bad. So what we should do, what he thinks is the, the solution to that, is to get rid of the idea of the commons, have private property evaluate the population on that and have um, only have certain people be in control of the of the grass and uh, have very strict population control coerced abortion sterilization he actually was in favor of these things so this is a, a good metaphor I think for environmentalists in terms of thinking of shared resources because you could think of the the commons as the air that we breathe, the water that we share, not just the earth, um, especially things that are something that we are fairly, that is limited in this way, that we do have to share it. But it's misleading in the sense, in, in a few senses, according to, um, well, according to folks like Murdoch and Oten, we'll talk about in a minute. But this idea that everything is a limited resource is not necessarily true. Think about solar energy. That's something that's not limited, that we can still um, share. We don't have to think of the oil and gas. Of course, that's a limited resource. But solar energy is not. There's enough power in the sun to power the whole world. Putting solar panels on 1% of the Sahara Desert could power the world um, according to Molem at Berkeley, Miram Molem. The second problem is that sharing resources doesn't have to be a tragedy. Um, there are, his model is that human greed will necessitate not having private property, but there are other models that have been considered and work in some places like cooperative models. You know, we have a co-op, we're all equal owners of that. Um, community-owned property works in some places. So, so that's a potential limitation. And then the third problem, of course, is that he's, he's focusing on this issue of overpopulation. And what he thought was that if you feed the sheep more, he's con kind of comparing the people to the sheep, they're going to produce more sheep. So the more you feed them, the more they're going to produce. And that leads to this second myth or mi misplaced metaphor, if you will, um, which is called, his work is called Lifeboat Ethics, the case against helping the poor. He claimed that rich countries are like lifeboats. Poor countries are like the people swimming around. This is how it just, uh, this is just how it starts. Um, and they're trying to get on the rich lifeboats. So if they climb on, everybody loses. If they're held back, at least the people from the rich nations will survive. So he thought, therefore, that rich nations shouldn't do anything to help the poor nations and should close their borders to immigrants, for example. 
Um, he knew that this argument lacked compassion, but he thought that if he, uh, that compassion would result in everybody dying. So this was an influential theory over the last 30 years. Um, but again, this is where I would talk about the critique of this argument that Murdoch and Oten make, and I'm going to add something to it as well, because they're saying that in the real world, nations interact with each other. It doesn't magically appear that you have the rich nation with the boat and the poor nations out in the water. Somehow the people got into the water to begin with. Um, for example, colonization, wars of commerce, exchange in the international marketplace that favors the rich nations, um, and these sorts of economic and political imbalances. And then, secondly, foreign aid programs that we've been talking about, have favored pro-Western U.S. foreign policy, which they clearly acknowledge. Um, it's supposed to defeat communism and promote U.S. farmers, for example. Um, and many of those, they say, govern the interests of a wealthy elite, and some are savagely repressive, in fact. Um, so sometimes we're subsidizing a regime that is repressive. Um, and then I would add to this a third way that the nations interact, which as we've seen is in our climate change responsibility. Our emissions are uh, much greater than those of the poorer nations, and yet we're not feeling those effects. So that's yet another way where people aren't really like, and nations aren't really like lifeboats and people inside. We're all much more related than that metaphor would indicate. And sometimes the relationship is not a beneficial one. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason, again, starting with Murdoch and Oten, is that it's actually empirically flawed. If we think about the idea of the birth rate, if you feed more people, they're going to have more babies, and then you'll have too many sheep in your pasture. Um, but the evidence actually shows that when you feed people, when they have better living standards, um, they actually have lower growth rates, lower birth rates. So these are complementary, not contradictory. So aid programs carefully designed to benefit the poorest people can help achieve both of these ends, better living standards and lower growth rates. Such programs are difficult to, to carry out, but not beyond the ingenuity of the rich nations. And this has borne out even today in our research. When we, women have access to contraceptives, of course, you would expect the birth rate to drop. But also, when women have access to education, economic security, political, legal empowerment, the birth rates in those nations drop to the point where some nations are worried that the birth rate has dropped too low in Western developed countries. Um, here's a chart of how the birth rate precisely has dropped. So, of course, um, the global population is, is projected to rise, but it's not because of the birth rate. The birth rates have been dropping in most places. Um, the reason is that people are living longer. We have better health. Um, we have more young people in general. So as modernization happens, though, you get more carbon emissions. So all of these things cycle back around to each other. So that's why social, economic, environmental sustainability all have to be considered together. This lifeboat metaphor is much too simple to, to encapsulate all the interrelationships. So let's go to, so that's just a review of why those things are myths. And remember also, there is enough food to feed the world already. So we can add that to one of the problems with this, these metaphors. Um, okay, so just a couple of arguments that we talk about in ethics class, you might have heard. Um, some of you might be from an ethics class that came out to see me today. But this is Peter Singer, and he wrote an article, Famine, Affluence, and Mo uh, Morality. He says that, as I write this, November 1971, people are dying in East Bengal from lack of food, shelter, medical care. The suffering and death that are occurring there now are not inevitable, not unavoidable in any fatalistic sense of the term. Um, people are refugees, 
And it's not beyond the capacity of the richer nations to help the poor. We know that you can provide a capsule for, of micronutrients that can reduce diarrhea and malnutrition in children fairly easily. So it's not beyond the capacity of people to provide that in the rich nations. Um, so his argument goes something like this. So imagine that you are walking outside at the Eastview campus today. You walk out there and there's a child in a shallow pool of, let's say, a baby pool that's drowning. So would you say that you have a moral obligation to help that child if you're just passing by? Yeah, I think we would start as our starting point. Yes, we would have a moral obligation in that case. Um, what if the pool were really deep? This is a little expansion of his argument. Um, would you always have an obligation to jump in and help the child if the pool is deep? If you can swim, what if you can't swim? Then you're really not helping the child anyway. You're not helping the child and you're hurting yourself. Find somebody else. Yeah, that's not too hard to do, is it? Okay, what if the water is shark infested? Do you have an obligation to jump in and help the child then? Yeah? <laughs> Maybe if you're really brave. Um, is that an obligation? You might think it's not worth it because you might get eaten by the shark. So you're kind of weighing that out. Um, so maybe we should jump in to save the child as long as we don't have to sacrifice anything that's sort of equal to that or that gets close to that. Okay, um, so now think about what if the child is halfway across the world and you're on your FaceTime or something and you can, you can tell the guy next to him, save the child. Do you have an obligation to help the child from far away? It's in your capacity to do that. It's in your reality anyway. So I think yes. Okay. So you already know about it. You've just been told about it. You see it in front of you. You're not ignorant. Okay. Um, what if... Let's come back to the child that's here, just in the, the shallow pool. What if there are a lot of other people standing around? You're not the only one who's walking past the kid. Every one of you go out there. Do you individually have a responsibility to help the child if there are other people? You can't, you can't assume that someone else is going to do it because in doing so, if they don't, you actively took that decision to do nothing. Okay, you're still making a decision to do nothing. What if everybody made that decision to do nothing? Then the child dies. Well, this is, um, this is what we're really talking about, according to Peter Singer. We're just talking about a malnourished child that's in our capacity to help, not a child that's um, right out here in a pool. So this is how his argument goes. I begin with the assumption that suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. We can all safely assume that that's a bad thing. If it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, like maybe my life um, or my arm if it's a shark, you may have to think about what, what it would be comparable, then we ought morally to do it. For the principle takes firstly no account of proximity or distance. Makes no moral difference whether the person I can help is a neighbor's child 10 yards from me or a Bengali whose name I shall never know 10,000 miles away. Secondly, the principle makes no distinction between cases in which I'm the only person who could possibly do anything and cases where I'm just one among millions in the same position. So therefore, he concludes, we ought to prevent suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care by contributing to relief funds up to the point that we should suffer something of equal moral importance. He doesn't just say, 
comparable. He actually goes so far as to say equal moral importance. What do you think about that argument? Especially as it relates to hunger here. It's pretty extreme, yeah. Well, uh, one of the good things with this argument is it does take into account that different people can help in different amounts. So for instance, let's say you have someone who's a billionaire versus someone who is just hurting the property line themselves. Then that equal moral importance, like let's just say, if it doesn't put you into poverty yourself, or it doesn't make you hungry yourself, that's a different level for different individuals. But it still is important for us all to come to our capacity. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that's a good point. You're considering yourself as one of the people that are matter in this situation. Um, do you reach up, you know, equal more impo- importance or less, less so? Uh, any other thoughts on that? Let me talk about another. Do we have some more time, Maria? Yeah, yeah. I was okay. just trying. Were you going to say something? Oh, she's bringing Your the microphone. microphone. Yeah. I thought I was getting the signal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, any other thoughts before I go on, on that argument? So another philosopher, I mentioned him earlier, is Amartya Sen. He's an Indian philosopher and economist who talks and writes about the right not to be hungry. So his example, this is actually my example, but I'm trying to put his theory into my strange example here. So I love Masaman curry. So let's say I go to a restaurant and I get all the Masaman curry that they have. I put it all in this big bowl and it's all mine. I own this Masaman curry. Um, I have the property right to it, and it is valuable intrinsically. It will give me food. Um, my, and I live in a country where property rights are considered to be inviolable, absolute. Now, I'm right across the street, though, from an orphanage where none of the children have any food. So philosophers like really extreme examples. So no food at the orphanage. No parents who made decisions for the children. They just don't have any food to eat. So do the children have any rights here? If I'm sitting out, you know, we can use that extreme example. I'm just eating it outside. I'm really enjoying it. And I'm looking at all the poor children around me. Do they have any rights in this case? ask and I say no it's mine too bad yeah well they're little children and let's say they're five and let's say I'm a lot bigger and stronger than I actually am do they have any rights here we have a really hard time trying you know even thinking about that the right to eat or the right to have food could be a right because we think about rights as something you can't take away. I have a right to this, a property right, something that nobody can take away from me. But Sen is saying the right not to be hungry is also a right. Sometimes we think of those as human rights or as a positive right. Uh huh. Yeah, people will tell you you can't do this, but you know that you can because why? What's an example that you are thinking of in in that? Like this example, the children know that they should be able to eat. There's plenty of food over here. Well, what he's saying is that we're so used to thinking of rights as inviolable and inalienable, like property rights are that, and we don't think of uh, being hungry as one of those types of intrinsically valuable rights. 
But he's saying that the right not to be hungry is another kind of right, just like the right to have property. So now we have two rights that are kind of battling it out. So either we could say that we try to say that property rights are absolute and we can't mess with those. Sad, but tough. Um, Others don't have that property. Or we try to say that property rights aren't valuable at all. We should be able to just distribute our food to everybody equally. Nobody can own anything. Um, but he's saying there's actually a third path here, which is to consider that both of these rights are intrinsically valuable. But they're both in service of a greater goal, which is human capability, human flourishing. So why do we even have property rights? We have those in order to promote human flourishing. Why do we need food? To promote our human flourishing. If we look at that goal perspective, then both of those rights need to be balanced when we're trying to reach that goal. Yeah? We need food before we can even have a right. How do we have a property if we haven't even eaten? because we, we wouldn't live to eat. Yeah? Um, I would say, um, the difference between those two rights is that one of them, you know, when I say I'm going to yourself and so much, so like, you do have the right to eat, but you can't, like, you don't have the right to impose yourself on someone else to say, hey, you need food, but uh, you do have the right to eat, receive. So what if, what if I own all the food, though, and you have a right to eat? Yeah, sin is, sin is saying that we have, that's how we've thought about our rights, but that there is a, a different way to think about them that actually expands what is uh, an absolute right. Yeah. Well, I think of, I think of the, I think of the <laughs> right to be, uh, not to be hungry in this case as kind of an extension of uh, the right to life itself and the right to happiness, which if you think about it that way, then those orphans in this situation have an absolute right to receive food in this case, as without it they will violate um, the right to live itself, which is a very fundamental and absolutely inalienable right. Yeah, so if you start with the right to life as an inviolable right, and if, if you shift it from this language of rights to the language of goals, we're kind of getting at what he's talking about, that both of those rights serve or should serve in the interest of the goal, which is the right to life or the flourishing life. Whether it's a right that you can't take away from me or a right to something that I have a right to have. Like we say we have a right to education. That's something that we are allowed to have. It's not something that's typically thought of as something you can't take away. So there's both those kinds of rights that serve in the interest of this goal orientation of human flourishing. So if we put all this together, go on a little here, I think I've lost my batteries at this point. Um, the, the other way we can, we can start to put all these multifaceted aspects together in an ethical approach called the sustainability framework. It, it includes human rights, and even the, these sorts of negative rights, as we were talking about, things not to take away, the, all those sorts of rights that people have. It also in, uh, encompasses economic reality. If you do these things and it doesn't work, then we may not be able to solve hunger. Um, and if you don't take into account environmental impacts, it's also not going to be able to solve global hunger. So all of those three elements, the social, the economic, and the environmental, work together in the sustainability framework. Yeah? 
Yeah, you want to use the microphone? <laughs> it feels weird at first. I mean, it's like you do the right thing, but that still doesn't work out, but then you don't want to do the wrong thing, and it still doesn't work out. So, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that brings up a lot of under interesting questions on how we measure and evaluate what was the right thing. Do we need an absolute principle that we go by, or do we look and see how things are going to I mean, work out in the end? You don't want to do too much of the right thing, because then... But then you don't want to do the wrong thing either. Yes. Because if you focus on one making... You focus on one path, then... Yeah, yeah if, you, if you want to um, create the perfect, most ecological, sustainable type of food, but you can only create three of those, and then all the other hundreds of people can't eat, right. then you've no longer made a, a truly ethical choice in that sense, according to the sustainability frame, because we had to balance the economic with the rights and the environment. Yeah, right. excellent point. It's a balance. So sustainability, according to the ethics of sustainability, is that um, it's the balanced pursuit of those three goods, ecological, social equity, economic welfare. It's grounded on the ethical commitment to well-being, not only of contemporary populations, but also future generations. It suggests that in the decision-making process, societies that have a good quality of life have an obligation to ensure both future societies and contemporary less well-off societies are able to achieve a standard of living in which their basic needs are met. And sometimes that idea, standard of living of basic needs, is considered this idea of the flourishing life that I'm talking about. Theorists who work on this might call it capabilities or um, the end result there of a, of a flourishing life. So we didn't even talk about, you know, who else is a stakeholder here? What about the future generations? So that's something that sustainability is, cap is able to factor in. So global hunger is on the rise. It's going to increase. Um, women and girls in sub-Saharan Africa suffer the worst consequences. Food's not usually a limited resource, except in war and climate emergencies. Helping end hunger in less developed nations will not make the population explode and deplete the food supply of wealthier nations. In fact, raising everyone's standard of living or flourishing life has been shown to deplete, you know, to, to reduce the fertility rate, and it certainly doesn't hurt wealthier nations because our rates are going down. Um, and we do have a moral obligation to help without causing more harm. This is a summary of what I've been talking about. I actually have a case study here that is not just me talking. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one that I'd like to show you um, of the case history in Malawi, which is one of those South African countries. If we look first at the idea of food aid as a, re as a response to undernourishment, See if I can get this to show. Hmm. Doesn't want to play. Yeah, usually a start button pops up. Up here? Yeah, usually there's one that's, uh, oh, here we go. Usually looking for open hyperlink, but I didn't see that. Well, I tell you what, this is not the really the important one that I wanted to show you anyway. This one, uh, oh, this is about Malawian food aid that goes over the points about the U.S. aid system that we um, have already talked about. What I really want to do is show you the solutions. So USAID was a problem in terms of dignity and in terms of um, losing local business when you just provide the food. It's arguing in favor of monetization. And then if we go, and that was in 19, um, 2007. If we go a little later to 2016, let's see if that one wants to come up. No, I think it might be a problem with the, well, again, I'm not, I'm not, the one that I really want to try to get to, to show you this. So this one is 
and I'll, you know, I'll make these available to anybody who wants it, but the, it's just a clip of a news story that talks about the fertilizer program. So we didn't want the food aid. What we want instead is the money, and that's going to help um, people be able to buy fertilizer so they can grow their crops. But the drought is still extreme, and this is where we see the quote that fertilizer is not going to help unless you actually have rain and crops to fertilize. So, okay. And what I'm going to do for this one is look it up this way. You can be thinking about if you have any questions here. Hmm. Well, this worked earlier. Okay, well, I apologize that this isn't coming up. I'm open to another, let's see if that will. Oh, I saw something. I think it might be coming. Here we go. Yay. I'm sure y'all all knew what to do. In a... In northern Malawi, farmers have found that it's possible for children to remain malnourished despite nutritious food being available. One solution breaks the rules of inequality at their most intimate, reducing the burden. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to do a good thing and did not. There we go. In northern Malawi, farmers have found that it's possible for children to remain malnourished despite nutritious food being available. One solution breaks the rules of inequality at their most intimate, reducing the burden on them by getting husbands to help out more in the kitchen. Oh. 
of the civil passing of the moon, but with a means of self, Jennifer's life has become better. This is when it's an hour, not why it's an hour, after all. So now, Jennifer is seeking an anthropological farming to other women in the community, paying it forward to the next generation. And I want to take a look at how this turns out, how this story goes.
right. So Live Aid or Women's Empowerment. What research shows is Live Aid is good for crises, food aid, monetization, but women's empowerment is what works in the long run. So again, this is a system. This is a complex issue. There's not a single right answer, but if we're looking at the long term and what works, I think that's what we need to look at. What I want to leave you with are some things that, that the IPCC has just come out with to show what works to reduce, to both mitigate climate change's effects and help communities adapt to them. And all of that, as we know, works with the food system. So today, we can do these things. We can certainly decrease our meat consumption, as we said, especially since we know how much methane and carbon emissions is part of that system. We can stop wasting the 40% of food that we're wasting uh -huh. in the environment, which is related to the food system. Exactly. Um, and then we can support organizations. Raj Patel's organization is called Gender, is called Generation Food, and I think he's got a film coming out on that soon. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, look at this first one here, add organic matter to the soil. So what this is is a list of all the different technologies, all the different transportation, supply side, demand side. The ones in dark green are the ones that are, have a very high potential effect. The ones that are lighter have some effect, but not as much. What I'm doing here is compiling the things that are most effective from what just came out this last couple of weeks. So adding organic matter to the soil is big planting diverse crops, managing water, planting times. That means don't just put it as a one-size-fits-all, but really get in there and manage this closely. Stop clearing land and manage livestock with more precision. So all these things are this micro level, this agroecology, as they might say, with different, more micro level technologies. And the thing about it is that women agrarians are already doing this. They have the knowledge of how to do this in their locale. But a lot of times that knowledge isn't recognized. Yeah. These things actually matter. Yeah, when we start thinking, oh, it's such a big, overwhelming problem. It's a, it is a big, overwhelming problem. But the studies are showing that it needs to be worked on and managed at this micro level more and more. Not just at the micro level, but that's a very important part. So that's where I'm going to end the talk today, and I'll see if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? You've been very patient sitting here again through the dinner hour. Yep. So you're talking that there is going to be another form of live aid. Um, oh, right. Back to that question. Thank you. Like, I don't know if you're necessarily arguing against the quick fix and looking towards more sustainable options, but like theoretically there could be a balance of both. So what would... Could you talk more about that? Well, what I was saying is that Brian May is say, saying that we should have a, another live aid for climate change. So that's, that's a question. Live aid in order to help people in emergency situations? Absolutely. We have, you know, you can't help it if you don't have the system in place to support your um, region. So sometimes you have to give people a fish or a bag of food. Um, what he's arguing is that we have a live aid for climate change to address, I assume he's talking about addressing this more systemic issue and the relationship between climate change and food. That's how they're so closely related that maybe if we solve, if we pour some more money, you know, do a live aid concert to get money for some of these things that work, that'll help the food hunger as well. Uh -huh. Um, women's empowerment and how it can improve these these situations for the community overall with hunger has that been addressed to um, like the people who give out the loans to for crops you know to do things maybe a certain way because it I mean if it works it works 
And now I'm going to show you something that's a, that shows you how challenging this is. It's exactly, it's one of the things I had to skip, but if you look at even the USAID website, Strengthening Resiliency for Smallholder Farms. So that sounds like resiliency is one of those sustainability words, smallholder farms. You know, it sounds like what we're talking about here, but if you look closely at what it says, and this is my underscore, um, the challenges it's saying are small land holdings in a poorly developed seed sector. So what it sounds to me like is that it's saying that it, it's unfortunately the agriculture sector sort of faces challenges like small land holdings. So a big land holding would be better. It faces the challenge of a poorly developed seed sector, like all these micro seed individuals who are working on this agroecology. What would be better, they're saying, is a well-developed seed sector. So again, it's these big technologies that are defining what it even means to, you know, to be a technology. The small technologies are kind of defined out of existence. Here's another example. This is a press release from Malawi about, um, which says, only qualified certified seed suppliers registered with government to produce or market seed should be allowed to display seed. That corporation is Monsanto. They're providing the seeds, they're providing the fertilizers, and they're also providing the medicines for when you get sick. This is according to this uh, Timothy Wise who reported on this. So, it, you know, that's one of the challenges that they, they have been told that the, the interests aren't always the same as the agrarian interests. Is that kind of it? Well, yeah, I noticed in the video that she was taking some dried seed from plants. And the problem with the Monsanto seeds is that you, they cannot be reused. Once a seed grows, then it doesn't produce a seed that can grow again. Right. So that's probably what, you know, a problem with a lot of poor people that can't, you know, reuse their seeds. Yeah, and that's what happened in Malawi. They were required to buy the seed in order to use that fertilizer that only works with that seed. And the seeds aren't heirloom. They don't get passed along. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so continuing to focus not just on the big technologies, we won't rule that out, but to give emphasis to the, the solutions in the small agrarian producers like women. All right, well thank you all. Have a good safe trip home tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm.